Portugal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you for coming out tonight to the Throckmorton Theater. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Moore Song. <laughs> some kind of wisdom. Uh, the best of whom was my mother. And uh, I was a writer too, you know. And uh, I worked at Sony Studios. I wrote, well, I wrote about 12 pictures of it. But uh, the head of the studio, Jeff Sigansky, said to me, uh, you may have some weaknesses because your mother didn't love you which is a Jewish cliché. <laughs> and the Jews have become a cliché. Well, <laughs> because they're reissued Jewish people. They're not the original Jewish people. <laughs> the last week a guy in a question period said to me, uh, what do you think of Sanders' chances? I know he doesn't want the part. That's Mill Valley speak for he's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and of course, this is all separate here. Living here is like a bonus to the people that inhabit Mill Valley. Now, most of the day, you know, I'm down at the Coyote Cafe, Greg Batlin's place, which he co owns with Cameron Batlin, and um, his grandson. And the people that I know, Mill Valley speak, before it started raining, when the sun would come out there, people would be having coffee and they'd say to me, uh, all another day in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd say, just shows you what God could do if he had money. <laughs> <laughs> So the trivialization of reality is because people are afraid of it. They don't know how to deal with it unless they talk to an analyst or something. They're not any good anymore either. You know, if you look back at Freud, look at the difference between inspiration and a guy just getting you to keep coming back twice a week <laughs> uh, for the standard fee. You know, Freud... Uh, was in Vienna. That's where he started to practice before. He came here as a refugee. And uh, he got up at the Vienna Medical Society and he said, there are forbidden areas. Nobody told you they're forbidden, but your fear has defined them as forbidden areas. And he started talking about guilt and sex and all. So the doctors started walking up. A couple of them spit on the floor where he spoke. They blackballed them, in effect. And what he said to them was, what you deny here, you will dream about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, has been borne out. And Freud had a dark sense of humor, too. Uh, his, uh, many of his protégés turned on him, uh, notably Adler, and uh, this, if, if you're such a great teacher, why did Adler uh, repudiate you? And Freud said, he can't forgive me for all I've done for him. <laughs> <laughs> Which is real Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Most people are afraid to make that last jump into being Jewish. You know, it, it's a different kind of thing. It's based on wisdom. It's not based on uh, social democracy which they base their lives on now. What's wrong with the liberals, the reason they can't win an election is they're not liberals, 
they became social democrats because they thought it was more stylish. Anyway, this patient comes in to see Freud and she says, I'm pregnant. What do you think I should do? And he said, tell your mother. <laughs> said, She'll kill me. And Freud said, no, that's what mothers are for. Now, I maintain that's a Jewish part of his nature that knew that. And you know, he used to make you pay $20 an hour because he said, if you don't pay, you won't come. You just don't think it's worth anything. So we had a little cash box. And when the Nazi stage crystal left, they knocked down his door and they took the money out. And they said, what do you think of this? We've got your money. And he said to the stormtrooper, I get more than that for a house call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was really something. I mean, and Jewish in the sense of innovation, and courage, that's all been lost now. Now it's showing re reflective action, like uh, uh, Barack Obama is a perfect example. The audis audacity of nope. Uh, <laughs> and the New Yorker is always writing about it. By the way, the New Yorker magazine, which used to be good at one time, <laughs> I'll tell you about this. David Remnick is a social democrat who was the editor, and I was in negotiation with him for some work, and I was teaching at Claremont, and uh, he said to me, what are you doing at Claremont? I said, my dad got lucky and sent me back to college. <laughs> uh, in fact, as you can see here, I'm very close to paying off my student loan. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's one of the inventions of Obama, you know, they still have repudiated the Democrats. Even though Trump pointed out today that that's the administration that was killing people by drone. 24 years in Afghanistan, and you can't show your face if you're female. So, fascinating. Under our sponsorship. So, a lot of what the show is about tonight is social hypocrisy. I didn't start that way. I started in about 1953 because I had the idea, idea that the audience was being liable, that the comedians were saying the audience wants commercial stuff that's easy to process and understand. But I thought that was a mental limitation of the comedians. It was a hokey excuse to say this is commercial and to say things that they didn't mean. So this led to a kind of revolution and the hungry eye. And then I brought in Woody and I brought in Streisand, as a matter of fact. And I brought in George Crow. I couldn't get Lenny in there because Enrico didn't like anybody swearing in the club. <laughs> Really a purist, you know, and uh, and you have to understand what he was. Enrico was from Bakersfield, <laughs> and his name was Harry. It wasn't Enrico. <laughs> and and uh, not not a fraud. A guy that didn't like reality and decided to alter it. That's what he really was. And there aren't too many guys that take that chance, you know. And people were always talking about improving themselves. But it, I don't see the improvement, generally speaking. Anyway, uh, uh, who else would we bring in there? Uh, any comedian you can mention, Jonathan Winters, who I think is the best. We started recording comedy acts there. Uh, comedy records, in effect. <clears throat> Two biggest frauds over there, Mike and Elaine, both stars. Uh, they made the woman out to be someone who deceives in order to score. Very simplistic. But, but an attack on women's lack of ethics, as they define it, 
And the other guy, Nichols, was a German Jew, you know. You can never have too much money. One of those guys. But not, not Russian Jews, which are totally different. The reason we are here tonight is that the German army, in error, attacked Stalingrad. And Stalin said to the general running Stalingrad now, who was uh, Gorbachev, Lieutenant General, he said, there is no land beyond the Volga. And the Germans surrounded the city, and then it started to snow, winter in Russia. And in the morning, 93,000 frozen Germans, including nine field marshals, surrendered, comrade. So they knew something about what was coming. They knew something. And all of that was all managed by Roosevelt. You notice yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, when uh, Trump went to Hanoi, it has one party, the Communist Party, founded by Ho Chi Minh, who made a deal with Roosevelt, and has the most solid economy in the Orient. Uh, nobody gets the point yet. They're still trying to feel better inside by voting for a black guy or listening to rap music. You know, it's what Stan Kevin said to me. I, I had the great honor of working with him, so he said, no matter what you call it, it is what it is. And I learned a lot from musicians. When I was at the Hungry Eye, Dave Brubeck was a teller at the American Trust Company. <laughs> and Paul Desmond was playing second alto in Jack Fina's band, which is a Freddie Martin knockoff in Berkeley. They were at the Blackhawk, and I was the only guy. And within a year, we were at the Playboy Jazz Festival, and we sold 65,000 tickets. So what I'm saying to you is, the American people are much maligned and they haven't earned that kind of derogation. They're the people that saved the world. And you are deceived along the way by certain guys. Uh, who are the certain guys? Lyndon Johnson is a good example. You know, I was at the Chicago Convention, you remember that? Yeah. With Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman and uh, the riots and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Chicago Illinois Police Department beating up demonstrators. And, uh, and then Johnson comes out and he says, Humphrey will be the next president. This girl sitting next to me said, Humphrey can't be president. He doesn't look like a president. So I explained to her because she was young. I said, everybody can't be as handsome as Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> we have to face reality. <laughs> so... Uh, Chicago was the hub, and that's where Playboy started. Yeah. And uh, I was in the middle of all that. And uh, uh, in fact, I married a bunny. I married the head bunny. There were 19 clubs with bunnies. And, uh, and I was married three times. If you're wondering, you know, if I, they keep me in a closet here and burn me out every <laughs> Thursday night. Uh, I was married three times. I'm very courageous. <laughs> you know, what do you got in your pocket? I say, put the money on the table, let's run with this drink. Awesome. Uh, didn't work out too well. Uh, a lot of people hold grudges. So what? So I believe in love. Mm -hmm. I really do believe in I love. I think it can conquer everything. And if your mother loved you, you can conquer anything. I don't want to make this like a nest meeting. <laughs> <laughs> if it was, I could work out now. Uh, but uh, I had one of those mothers. You know, and I was very lucky there. And my dad was more pessimistic. Uh, but anyway. Let me go back to this. So, when I finally went to work and I made my own terms, 
because when it caught on, I hold the attendance record in every club I ever worked there. When it caught on, it was like a forest fire, or I should say, a PG&E fire. <laughs> I'm actually technically correct. Huh? And, and for all of that, uh, you know, the comedians kept saying, it's too intellectual and people will never step up to the plate and swing. It's not true. The American people are much more like. They stopped fascism and they did it with Roosevelt at the Hill. And everybody forgot that. If you go to Washington, don't go to the Lincoln Memorial and cry. Go to the Jefferson Memorial and dream. Mm. That's where it really is. You know, Jefferson had a great love affair and he couldn't decide whether to leave his wife. So he wrote letters to the girlfriend and he wrote two letters. One said, Dear Head, you gotta stay with your marriage and keep your vow. And the other one said, Dear Heart, just be patient. Love conquers all. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson at 27. So, I believe in the written word, and I believe your hunches. Your hunches are what make you go. Well, a lot of the comedians don't agree with me. You can see that most of them come out, come out of comedy clubs. They have that here on Tuesdays. And that, it's a great thing. The owners love it because they don't have to pay anybody. And those guys get up and talk about what they think is on the audience's mind. I think the audience is as little illiterate as they are. When they say to me, you know, as a compliment, they say, you're the father of the modern stand-up comedian, and uh, I don't want a paternity test <laughs> before, before that's going around my neck. Uh, the best one I ever worked with was Jonathan Winters. We took off from here. I took off from my Austin Healy. Remember that car? I drove to New York and we opened with the Blue Angel. $200 a week. And the owner was a snob, velvet suit, you know, just sh short of a homosexual decision, you know. And he, he used to go in the dark and say, I can't hear you because you don't want to talk to me. So you don't talk about I can't, so well, I couldn't hear him. So I said to Jonathan, what did he say? And Jonathan said, he said, I can't pay you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is closer to the truth. <laughs> and all the establishment comedians said I was going to die and it would never work and everything, uh, including Jerry Lewis. So, uh, with whom I made a movie two years ago. And, uh, Lewis said to me, if you listen to me, put on a tuxedo and show respect for people and tell commercial jokes. So he said, to show me his power, he picks up the phone and give me a Sands Hotel. Jack and Trotter, please. We write some outreach checks, right? Jack is a Jerry. How would you like? to be the first guy in Vegas to present the new Ward song. And the other end of the phone I hear, I didn't like the old Ward song. <laughs> so that was the end of that. I finally got there with Kim, uh, working for Concordia. He's a great guy, straight life guy, you know, uh, as we used to say in the jazz business. So I hung on to it. I thought everybody is as smart as I am and everybody's concerned with true love just as I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not. Uh, this entire generation has been co-opted by money. They're all standing around saying, yeah, it's a great idea, board. how can you monetize it? That's <laughs> the great, they're great verb they came up with. Well, you can monetize it by burning your principles. That's always the quickest way to get money. <laughs> and this, this thing over here, you know, I, I lived in North Beach with Sue when I first got going with the whole reality. 
Now, that school was really something. The west side of L.A., Jewish girl, first life to the parents. I want to take this course, and I don't want for any of UCLA. I have to go to Berkeley. <laughs> then she gets the bread from them, and she comes up here. And she would come from Bohemia, plays Billy Holiday records, drinks red wine, smokes camels, <laughs> uh, lives uh, near Speedy's up there on the hill behind the, the Enrico's Coffee House. And uh, I'm in LA. I don't work. I want to be a comedian. Nobody wants it. So she and two other girls are going to be roommates. She said, will you drive us up? So I said, I haven't got a car. <laughs> so she gave me $35, and I bought a, a Ford three-window, a 36 Ford three-window. And I drove them up here, and I slept on a window seat in that apartment <laughs> and walked around Berkeley, you know. Bought coffee and donut, cut in four parts, put in my coat in case I get hungry for dinner. I'm going to be a comedian. So, very smart girl. And one night, she said to me, you know, you may have no talent. <laughs> How dare you? I said, you really think so? She said, I don't know. <laughs> but she said, if you don't do this, you're going to hate me. So I ain't going to be much of a marriage. Smart chick. Yeah. She said to me, but if you go over there and they like it, then we'll have everything. And uh, who knows? So I said, where will I go? She said, go to the hungry act. I said, well, they don't laugh. She said, they'll interpret the humor as whimsical. <laughs> and they'll laugh. So she told all her friends at the school to go there. And they filled the place. And I got up and I got all the laughs. And Enrico gave me a contract for a week for $75. Uh, of course, the second night was not as successful because when people couldn't come every night, they had classes <laughs> in Berkeley. And, and then the call. Then he told the manager, this guy is awful, get rid of them. And he said, you never want to get your hands dirty. If you're so awful, you get rid of them. It was like that. And by that time, I was developing material. You know? A psych major from Berkeley is working at the American Trust Company, and a gangster comes in and says, gives him a note, give me all the money in, in the drawer. Act normal, and you will not be harmed. And the guy writes back, define your terms. <laughs> See, so not calling on people began to quote it and so forth, and then other comedians tried to steal it. So, and then I kept finding people like George Carlin and Yay. Lenny, and then and Rico wouldn't put money in because he cursed. And they made a movie about Lenny, in which Hoffman hired me as the technical advisor for Bob Fosse, who was a genius. And uh, Lenny dealt more in urban irony, but he was not a genius. Uh, and Enrico wouldn't let him in because he cursed. And in those days, if a guy cursed on the stage, the girl would say to the guy, let's get out of here. That's the way girls were then. They weren't liberated like the movie industry. So, Lenny, who I really knew well, you know, every Sunday night, his wife was a stripper, you know, Honey Harlow, and every Sunday night they'd go to a French movie and then have Chinese food. So we'd go to a Chinese place and the guy'd say, oh, Lenny, you come for dinner, you bring mama, good, good. <laughs> and he had a relationship. So Honey finally leaves Lenny, and Lenny walks in there alone. And the guy said, Lenny, where mama? <laughs> Lenny said, and I had to tell you, man, that she left me. And the owner said, you're better off. <laughs> so the irony was starting to creep into the humor. 
slowly and with a lot of resistance. Then Dustin Hoffman made that movie and made him into a Catholic priest, but <laughs> he wasn't exactly, you know. So, anyway, of course, what happened is when I succeeded, it was in a big way. I called Sue out here and I said, we just broke the record in Basin Street and they gave me a $45,000 bonus. Can you pick me up at the airport? She said, no, I have a class and I'm a person too. <laughs> so it's the beginning. Uh, here comes temptation. So, uh, I got mixed up a mattress down there. And she was making a movie with Sinatra called Johnny Contra. And Sinatra called me and he said, you're not going out with that chick, are you? I said, why are you accusing me? What are you talking about? He said, when you have a sore throat, she won't bring any chicken soup. <laughs> he was smart then, you know, even then. Then I went through a whole candy campaign with him. And then he hired me out to Joe Kennedy to write for the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the rest is history. I'll tell you more about this no. later. Mm -hmm. just you. And I wound up on a television show in Los Angeles. And one night I had an author on called Mark Lane. And he wrote Rush to Joe. And he said, the Warren Commission is a lie. So I had him back. I had him back. The audience has got bigger in the studio. And they called me from the Pickwick Bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard and they said, this is the first time anybody's made a bestseller out of a book outside of New York. So I began to talk about the Warren Report, and I thought the government was lying. And then the station called me in and they said, you're fired. So 11,000 students began to pick at the station from UCLA. So they rehired me and they said, but you can't grind an axe on Canada. You gotta have new evidence. And along came the district attorney of New World, Jim Garrison. And I went down there and interviewed him on the air and enjoyed his staff. And of course, with the trial of Clay Shaw, which was made into a movie called JFK with Kevin Costner, which couldn't be further from the truth. But it was a great experience to stick your neck up. In fact, I think that's what Americans were made for. That's what we are. And a slight uh, disparity here is that sometimes we love women that don't understand them, that we aspire to something else. Why don't they understand? Because they're dumb, they're far from dumb. Uh, what they do is they don't believe guys like that are real because there aren't enough examples. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to dream too. If you ever took a girl in the movies, you know that. The old movies. Why do you think you can go take a girl to see Bogart and McCall and she's receptive to you when you take her hand? But not today, because it's not heroic. I mean, you see it. The good examples are in politics, you know. But believe me, everybody wants it. They want other things too. But under that, they still want that. Uh, is I don't believe I'm unique. I believe I'm an American kid that finally found the map. That's all. And of course I had to go to the Bay Area find it, it wasn't the LA, but I spent a good amount of time down there. And I got married three times, looking for justice. 
Never found them. But I didn't give up on the form. You see, what happens along the way is some men see what happens to their fathers and it intimidates them. And some men see it and infuriates them. And those are the guys that change the world. And they confuse you. The government is there to confuse you day and night. You know? Well, what happened on Trump? Well, he's been sleeping with Smokey Daniels. What's her name? Stormy <laughs> Weather. And, uh, but that's not the point. You don't want to lynch a guy because he likes to sleep with different chicks. That's not what it's about. It's not about that. It's about you being enough of a woman in his heart that he doesn't go there. He doesn't need to. He can get high in his own supply. That's what really about. I've never said that out here before. But sex is a distraction anyway. <laughs> when you come right down to it. The problem is the society is so distracted that you can't come right down to it. I mean, look how look at the lack of reality on television with, with the streaming. And, uh, I was a fighter pilot, but I was raped by a superior officer. Camilla uh, uh, Harris wants to give reparations to black people, paying off the guilt all the time, assuming there is guilt and then addressing it incorrectly. It's all nonsense. I work mainly with jazz guys, you know. Kevin, the modern jazz quartet, Brubeck, a lot of the colleges. And the real music in your heart is about having chops and laying down your version of the dream of love. That's the real music. The other stuff is all hokum. Rap is not music. It's a political statement. Mm -hmm. But the liberals think they have this duty to make the American dream come true for the minorities. And of course, they never have. I mean, Sanders is going to be, what, 83 when he runs? And I don't believe him. I don't believe him. It's an easy test. You know, you got to look at it and hear it, and it's like a proposal. And he guy's got, got a right to pitch a chick. It's their chops to see who means it, and who'll be there when they look over in the morning. And they're smart on it. They're plenty smart. It is coming from a man who's been married three times, <laughs> and, and mixed up with people endlessly. Why? Because of the movies. Because you see those movies and, 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 you know. The other night I saw a movie called In a Lonely Place with Bogey and Gloria Graham. And she leaves him because he always gets juice and punches somebody. So she leaves him. And he writes her a note. He says, I was born when I met you. I died when you left me. I lived for a while when you loved me. There isn't any guy that I know in the Writers Guild now that has the courage to write that. Now, most of those guys who wrote that stuff were communists anyway. And they were blackness. And the first political joke that paid off the hungry eye, remember when they sent the writers to jail for a year on American activities? I said, Every time the Russians throw an American in jail, we throw an American in jail to show them <laughs> they can't get away with it. That was the first thing. <laughs> so, you know, it was like that. So, Kathleen, do we have any questions tonight? Yes, we do, Mo. We have a few. Um, you mentioned your fondness for musicians. Who were some of your favorite drummers? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> 
Stan Levy with the Kelton Band, and uh, Mel Lewis with the Kelton Band, and I knew Buddy Rich. Uh, a lot of you have been to Palm Springs, right? Mm -hmm. And so many actors are always down there, they were tired of the drive, so they used to pool on the weekends. So one weekend, I went with Buddy Rich and Len Turner, because they wanted to run. So I'm in the car, and Len says, what's the good of being a screen beauty when you haven't got a home? I can't make a marriage stick. So Buddy Rich says, why don't you marry me? <laughs> and she said, you? You? And she started to laugh. <laughs> you? Ah! <laughs> So he opened the car door in a fast lane, and she jumped out of the car, <gasps> laughing. And he drove off down the freeway. So nobody laughed at me. I don't know what happened to her. I think she became a star in Metro. But uh, the whole idea that everybody's looking for it and everybody hides it. Why do you think people keep going to see Casablanca? With Bogart, same thing, Rick Bergman, you know. Well, I always have Paris. We don't have now, but we have Paris. I remember Paris even because the Germans wore gray and you wore blue. People would laugh at that today. They wouldn't believe anybody would remember it. Uh, you know, but I don't know if anybody today would. Go back, last night they showed Sabrina. Go back and look at Audrey Hepburn. That's a prize worth waiting for, worth working for. It ain't Star Wars, but it's something else that this generation has not attained. Women are, believe it or not, in an inferior position. They were promoted from a superior position to an inferior position. My guess who the Republicans? No, the liberals. Whenever anybody gives you a cookie, make sure before you bite it, especially if it comes from Democrats. It's unbelievable. I mean, what they sold here, what they sold. And today I was watching Anderson Cooper attacking Trump for five hours. <laughs> and you remember when Sterling owned the Clippers? Remember that? And he had that young chick? And she records him saying, when you come to the game, don't bring any black guys. Next night, Anderson Cooper is there with Sterling. And he says, how could you say such an insensitive thing? And Sterling says, well, Anderson, you know, when you get that feeling for a girl and Anderson didn't respond, <laughs> and we'll never know why, <laughs> they're trying to tell you that simulation is as good as the real thing. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I don't think no is a proper response when a woman invites you to live. I'm saying it like I've heard that often. Not that often, you know. And if any of you read my biography, you know, I have two of them out now. There's the one I wrote, Heartland, which is on Amazon. And there's the one that uh, Jim Curtis wrote, in which Chena attacks me for like 300 pages. The terrible guy I am. And that would knock any guy down. No loyalty will knock any guy down. That would knock Mike Tyson down. And uh, you expect that. That's really what you expect from love. There is one girl out there that understands my action. That's really what it is. And this is the right where I am. I'll you. So, yeah, Catherine, what else you got? Um, well, are, are there any questions in the room? Yes. 
gets to see the church and love. Since reparations seemed like a loony bin move to you, what would you do about the results of slavery? What was the first part of that? Language? In lieu of reparations, what would you do about slavery? Slavery? Yeah. To support modern. You mean having to report to, to a Facebook every day? This is modern slavery. Your father advances you money to buy a house your wife dreams of. And you're born in a huck. Slavery. You can't. If you go to Washington, I told you, you can go to, to Lincoln Memorial and cry, or you can go to Jefferson Memorial and dream. I know I worked that I had a talk radio show there. You know, I had a long history with the Kennedys working with them. The old man was the worst you ever met. And uh, he tried to pay everybody off. And you saw where it gone. Yeah. And today, that group that's trying to talk uh, Trump out of the driver's seat the FBI, which was run by a crossdresser who blackmailed 12 presidents at the very least. And uh, I learned a lot when I worked in the morals. You know, I was an investigator in the office. And yes, the, the government does kill people and tries to kill others. Tried to kill Garrison. When I spoke about this at Niagara Falls Community College, they put acid in my coffee. And I went off the road and broke my back. They were hoping more. Uh, why did they hate Kennedy? Well, we'll never know because they never investigated it. You realize that when the president was killed in Texas, that Johnson and the FBI removed the corpus delecta and is not allowed in any murder in any state in the country. They removed the body, and in the National Archives, Kennedy's brain is still missing. Admiral Humes, who did the autopsy, burned his notes afterwards. By the way, you love this. I was at the Playboy Mansion one day and Johnson was meeting with Martin Luther King to negotiate the end of the war and Bob Hope was in the house. They were in there for three hours and uh, Hope said, Johnson is going to make King a cardinal, that way he only have to kiss his ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was good. Uh, there was a lot of natural natural feed there. But uh, reparations? Kamala Harris from president. When are 40 million people in California going to decide that there shouldn't be the reign of a permanent Jesuit? I mean, suppose. That's not good government. Good government is what Roosevelt did. And you notice they kept everybody working. They started the Federal Theater, which started Orson Welles, Burt Lancaster, Clifford Odets, some of the kids up to work in the forest, CCC. It's a different country, based on optimism, not on uh, flag waving. First of all, you can't bribe minority people to love you. They got their eye on the prize. What is the prize in America? Well, prize, I think, is the girl. But most Americans think the prize is the money. That's the difference. You got to decide what's important, but it's what you're brought up on. If you're brought up on programs written by Norman Lear, not the movies of 
than the Warner Brothers, man, among others. I was a writer, too, you know. I wrote 22 movies. The best thing to do is write your aspiration. Don't worry if they're realistic. Just like when you get a fix on a girl, tell her your dreams and see how they play. That's how you know if you made the right choice. Anybody that encourages the dreams. And uh, yeah, Dave Brubeck was a teller of the American Trust Company. Before the band called on. Can you believe that? In the East Bay. Mort, did you know a drummer by the name of uh, Lewis Belson? No. Uh, I don't know. That was a question that came in. Is he calling all of them? No, the question was whether you knew Lewis Belson, the drummer. I know everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I had a good run most of the time, but you have to love something to come along. I learned that from my mother. Uh, One minute, please. Um, Mort, that that drummer, Louis Belson, married Pearl Bailey. That's what I was going to say. Who? Pearl Bailey. The drummer, Louis Belson, married yeah. Pearl Bailey. Yes, I know. They oh. lived in Sun City. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, I knew Louis Belson and I knew her. Hope you were a lot of movies, you know. You know, you love this. Do a lot of you remember Betty Houghton? Mm -hmm. Remember she played Annie Get Your Gun? She was right back in there in Beverly Hills. She was married to a trumpet player named Pete Campbell. And he got sick of arguing with her one night and he left. And he got into his Porsche. So she came out with a rifle. And she said, don't you leave while I'm telling my son of it. And she put a hole in his fender and stopped the car and he said, Hey, baby, don't you know you can't get a man with a gun? <laughs> Musicians will always look for the light side of the park. <laughs> you know, you know, that's why. So, you know, what I'm asking you to do is not change your mind to mine. I'm asking you to consider that there's some other flavor than what they're offering us. You know, uh, you see where it all went to hell is when I went to 24 hour news. When I was Cronkite and Chet Huntley and David Brinkley, it was just a half hour news. First it was 15 minutes. I worked for NBC News. I was at the uh, Carter Convention, <laughs> and Jimmy Carter. So I'm outside the Americana Hotel, that's where you stay, and all the floors are named after states. You know, anxiety, depression. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Carter gets on the line. So he comes downstairs. <laughs> and his mother is with him. So a reporter said, Miss Lillian, now that he's going to be president, do you identify with Rose Kennedy and that tragedy? She said, Lord, no. Jimmy would never do anything they shoot him for. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it worked out. You can always believe yeah. God's mother. Yeah. She was in the Peace Corps, too, you know. <laughs> and in India. This job has taken me in a lot of great places. Yeah. But I still believe the movies. Uh, nobody can resist Castle Blanca. Uh, uh, it, uh, it is true that women can turn men into boys 
and turn boys back into men. Why is that? There's no propaganda for it. All I keep talking about is we're all the same. We're not all the same. Thank God. Yeah. And uh, whoever he may be. <laughs> but, you know, all I'm suggesting here is not that radical. It's that the status quo is imitation food. It's not real nutrition. The world may have changed, but it didn't change that much. That's what. What else, Kathleen? Any other questions? Yes, please. Are there any presidential candidates currently that you feel positive about? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. I wonder how many came into it since. <laughs> uh, no, because uh, I don't believe them. It isn't what they promise, it's that they will mean it. I mean, uh, the, the one uh, uh, the one Trump calls Pocahontas, Elizabeth Warren, uh, if they can't get him out of there, short of having the FBI make up a script about his nature, he does have a nature. It was formed by his father. What's so hard about that? Some men see what happens to their fathers. You know, that's, that's the basis of writing and of judging. Look at Rand Paul. His character was based on Ron Paul, his father, who was up there for 40 years and never told a lie in Congress. Paul said to me, I said, what was your home like? He said, nurture versus nurture. <laughs> I bet. Eh? Humor is just a shortcut to make the case. And you're not making the case because people agree with you. You're making the case because they don't agree with you. I don't find that most people are going to agree with you. They're going to, they're going to pretend this is the best of all possible worlds. But that doesn't help you at night when you can't sleep and you put your hand down on the side of the bed is lumpy and empty. Uh, look what happened when Hefner found out about sex. What did he do to that? He monetized it, stamped out pictures of girls and sold them to people. And 15 year old guys bought the magazine and went upstairs to the room and got on in the blanket with a flashlight. <laughs> Rolling. Yeah. And he never found out what life was about. And, uh, man, I just talked to Woody Allen, by the way, who was in Spain making a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Mia Farrow was in Connecticut attacking him. And, uh, not in a literal way, you understand. But there's this thing about the liberals, the righteousness makes me suspicious. They, they have to have the blessing of the majority before they do what they want to do, or do they want to do anything? I find a lot of materialism, I mean, talking about how rich Zuckerberg is. You know, uh, by the way, for those of you who do uh, cruise the internet, yesterday they posted the Academy Award show I ever seen, 1960. And Bob Hope introduces me and he says, here he is, the favorite comedian of nuclear physicists everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Good God. <laughs> he delivered what he promised. He and Crosby split over Kennedy and Nixon. Crosby was a Catholic and he stayed with Kennedy. And I uh, hope stayed uh, with Nixon. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, it doesn't matter now, I suppose. But the way we're living now, tomorrow is just a suggestion. 
I say the machine was made to take apart and inspect, not to adjust it. The comedians never agreed with me. Jonathan Winters had a good one, he said. He was working on his father's fields in Ohio, and a flying saucer landed, and a green man got out and said, take me to your leader. And he couldn't do it because he doesn't know who his leader is. <laughs> <laughs> the most gifted guy. <laughs> Woody, you know, is a different case entirely. Uh, I met him way back on the Hungry I started. And uh, he's very guilty about being a millionaire. And he doesn't think he's worthy. And so when they interview him, he changes the subject. He said, you know, Mort really inspired me. Mort's a genius. So I called him up to thank him, you know. And uh, the guys running Miramax on him were Harvey Weinstein. And he, they invited me to screening of his picture. So I go there. Woody's way in the back with a fishing hat on and dark glasses and an army field jacket. You know, very. And uh, this guy's talking about it. He said, uh, leave him alone. So I said, you're not a bodyguard, are you? Woody Allen was a bodyguard? He's a comedian for all of us. The guy said, well, he had a pretty rough time, you know. Me and Farrell said, he's thinking about him and the family. And for a long time, he quit. His name was Mark. I said, you're kidding. He said, yeah. And then one day, he had an epiphany. And I said, epiphany? I never heard people use that in regular language. Have you thought about writing? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, all I know is you can't see him. So when he hears all this noise, and he comes over to me, he's got an army field jacket on and fishing hat, dark glasses. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I want to thank you because you said in Time Magazine that I changed your life by example. So he said, yeah, I did. Did you get to the end of the article where I say, can you change it back? <laughs> Good guy. Well, uh, oh, he's not on a crusade like that. I need a subsidy, you know. And I have to tell you, the subsidy from Joe Kennedy didn't make it. It's that heavy duty, you know. And uh, I had no idea, to be so frank with you, you know, but I had an aspiring dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to sound like a Christian, but even at that heavy expense. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this one. my best friend at one time was John Hart, anchor man for NBC News. Mm. And I said to him on the phone, sometimes you have to forgive people. And he said to me, oh my God. I said, what's the matter? He said, you're a Christian. <laughs> I said, and you're a liberal. But because I'm a real Christian, I'm going to forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that, that's what intellectuals do instead of hugging each other. Uh, hugging each other and saying, I wonder what that meant. Uh, I don't think you can hide, hide from the facts, no matter how clever you are. And most people aren't that clever. But they aspire, you know, reparations. <laughs> they'll promise people anything to get that job, and you know. If you were working as a comedian, how would you handle something like Clinton? Yeah, I knew that would bring it to a side. <laughs> First of all, when the Lewinsky thing broke, 
I was in the White House. And I was working at a club called uh, in Georgetown. Anyway, I was in the White House and she was yelling at him in there. How can you be so stupid? Yelling at him. Oh, white West Wing heard him. And uh, this guy comes out of the work for the Jewish staff and he said, work for Banana. And he said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm shocked that somebody talking to the president that way. He said, well, that's not the first argument you heard between two married people, are you? I said, well, I'm not arguing about the color of the grapes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I to laugh because it's liberal. Yeah. <laughs> it was a stereotype. And then the Lewinsky thing, how would you handle that if you had a job like that? Well, the only joke you could come up with possibly is any guy that could get a Jewish girl to do that for him deserves to be present. But <laughs> 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 well, I'm too puritanical to tell that joke. I'm excited. One more time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Kathleen, anything else to it? One last question, Mort, to yeah. end the show. Who were the unlikely allies that helped you along the way? That did what? Helped you along the way. Oh, uh, I can tell you. Uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, Burt Reynolds, Paul Newman in the business, and in, in the political business, uh, uh, Eugene McCarthy, Adelaide Stevenson, and Sean Marlene the future. She said to me, don't marry an actress. If she's successful, you'll never see her. And if she's not successful, you wish you hadn't seen her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't too good a student in those days, and I couldn't translate that into a way to live. But I mean, well, where are we? I mean, yeah, people are worried about what Mark Zuckerberg thinks. Mm -hmm. And Goldman Sachs is running Facebook. I think what we're missing are our moms. People we can worship and take after. You know, McCarthy, you know, when he ran for president, you know, he stopped Vietnam because he ran in the New Hampshire primary and defeated Johnson, which stopped Democrats that year. So I saw a lot of him. McCarthy was in a debate with Mark Dayton, who was a senator from Ohio, and he said, I have no political experience, but neither did Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so McCarthy got up and he said, well, uh, I do have political experience. And, uh, I, uh, I was on a first name basis with Adenauer and De Gaulle. Come to think of it, I may be overqualified for this job. <laughs> <laughs> one night I was with McCarthy in Washington and Nixon stopped his car and he said to McCarthy, uh, what would you do with a guy like Fidel Castro? And McCarthy said, make him baseball commissioner. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. A car full of Secret Service guy. <laughs> Nixon, you know, I knew well, and he told me, he said, you got to make sure to keep a bull torch on the Democrats' asses as well as mine. And he bought me bourbon, which he drank a lot of. <laughs> and he was in the company of Henry Kissinger, who is rumored as Jewish. <laughs> I hope that won't hurt his case. Henry Kissinger was a Secretary of State. For him, and they said he was so good at it that if you were drumming 20 feet from shore, he would throw you a 15-foot rope 
and report to Nixon that he had met you more than a half life. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Mort. Thank you very much.